So Tracy's already uh, mentioned uh, my strange background. I was in research doing psychoacoustics, um, had a PhD in medical physics. At 31, I decided to give that up and become a school teacher for a number of years. And then I trained teachers. And then I started doing educational research. And I think when I gave up research when I was 31, it was because I decided it really wasn't useful. And I became a teacher because I wanted to do something useful. Um, I think what happened along the way is that I began to realize that, yeah, teaching is really useful, but so is research as well. And I rediscovered research. And my background allowed me to start using neuroimaging and functional magnetic resonance imaging in particular to look inside the brain and start asking educational questions using neuroscientific techniques. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about technology. And I'm going to start off by talking to you about the, some of the negative sides or some of the anxieties about technology. And then I'm going to start talking to you about some of the applications of technology. And the reason why I'm combining these two things together is actually because a lot of the same principles, issues, brain regions are involved. And I think if we're to go forward with applying technology, we need to understand a little bit more about those. OK, so um, how do I move this on? <laughs> ah. I was coming to talk to you about technology, but I can't use my PowerPoint. Did you spot the irony there? OK, so I, I come from Bristol, where I coordinate the Center for Mind and Brain in Educational and Social Contexts. We do basic neuroscience. We do bridging studies between neuroscience and the classroom. We help, well, we don't help, really. I think the teachers help us develop classroom practice using these concepts. Um, I spend and my colleagues spend quite a bit of time in public communication. There's a lot of these issues that the, the public, parents and learners, as well as teachers, are very interested in. And one of the things we do is consult with teachers to make sure that the teacher's voice is heard in this discussion about how neuroscience should inform education and how education should inform neuroscience. Um, while I'm on that subject, uh, as part of that dialogue, we are very interested in making contact with teachers here in Ecuador and in other Latin American countries because we want to have some one-to-one -one conversations with you about why you're interested in the brain. And my PhD student, whose first language is Spanish, um, has asked me to put this slide up, which I don't understand, but, but probably you do. Um, and if you feel able to have a 20-minute Skype conversation uh, with, with, um, with us, that would be really appreciated. Her email is there. You can contact her on that email. Please do volunteer. The email will be up at the end. Or you can come up to me at the end. Yes, you probably can't see that at the bottom. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's too low. I should never do this, should I? OK, I'll tell you what. I don't, I'm not a Mac user, unfortunately. You have to, you have to get me, me, bring me back. I'm going to just do it. <laughs> OK, forget it. At, at the end, thanks ever so much, Mark. Um, I'll, I'll put that email up at the end. But if you can give me your email after this session or tomorrow, that would be fantastic. And we can sort it out like that. OK, so some headlines, the sort of headlines that make parents anxious, make teachers anxious. These are some of the headlines we've been reading in Britain. Google is degrading our intelligence. Facebook is infantilizing us, which I think means making us like children. Technology is the 21st century addiction. And this is actually a headline that went right across the newspaper. Facebook and Twitter are creating a vain generation of self-obsessed people with childlike need for feedback, warns top scientist. <laughs> Texting at night disrupts children's sleep and memory. Now, which of these do we believe? Which do we not believe? Well, uh, two years ago, I was asked to conduct a 
review of all the research that we had at that time to understand how technology was affecting the well-being, particularly of our children. And it was the Nominet Trust that paid for this, which is a charity in the UK. Uh, but it was particularly interesting to me because I have five children myself, and they are all mad about technology in different ways. So all the time I was doing the review, I was thinking, so what am I going to do about this? So let's take the first question, can Google rewire the brain? Well, here is some evidence that's been used to suggest that it is rewiring the brain. Gary Small and colleagues put um, older adults in a brain scanner and they asked them to do one of two things, either to search on the internet or to read a book. And then he looked at the difference in activations in those two conditions. And there were two types of participant in this sample. One was a naive user who'd never used a search engine before, never used Google before. And the other type of participant was somebody who was actually very experienced at using Google. And what he found was that relative to reading, the experienced users were using a whole extra range of brain regions when they were searching on the internet. And that represents all those red regions there on the right. On the left, there was still some additional activity, even when naive users were using the internet. So this is evidence clearly that using Google, using search engines, changes the functioning of the human brain. And the question is, should we worry about it? Well, possibly not, because our brains are plastic. And whenever we learn anything, in fact, whenever we have any memorable experience, there has to be some change in our brain in order for that to be remembered and for us to learn. Learning involves changes in neural connectivity, the connections between uh, different regions of the brain, the connections between neurons. And quite often, you see that happening as shifts in neuronal activity from one region of the brain to the next. In this study that was by Margaret de Laser, what you're looking here is what you're looking at here is the changes in brain activity when adults had trained on complex multiplication questions. So they'd learnt to do some complex multiplication, and these are the changes in their brains having learnt that complex multiplication, and the, and the activities are when they're now doing the, mul the multiplication. And what you can see is that on the left-hand side there is a Region, there are regions of the brain that have decreased their activity, and these, we think, represent a decrease in the burden on working memory. Now, do you know what working memory is? Just, can I just ask you to put your hand up if you know what working memory is? Okay, so I, I obviously I should explain that. Working memory is our ability to hold information in our conscious attention, and actually it's quite limited. You can probably only hold about five, six, seven, or eight things in your attention at any one time. And it's a major bottleneck for our learning because of that. Whenever we learn something new, we have to hold a lot of extra information in our conscious attention. So we have to remember what the teachers told us. We have to remember the mistakes we made last time. We have to remember the next thing we're going to do as well as the thing we're doing now. We have to remember not to pay any attention to the guy next to us who is distracting us. All those things are a burden on our working memory. But when we learn to do something well because we've practiced it, then we need less information in our conscious attention because we're doing it automatically. So that's why you see a decrease in regions in, the, in this part of the, the brain here, which are related to a decrease in how much you need to burden your working memory when you're carrying out these, these problems. And on the right, you can see an increase in activity in a more posterior part of the brain, more towards the back, which uh, DeLazer interpreted as an increase in automatic processing. So when we learn something, we see these shifts in neuronal activity. And now when we go back to the question, is Google rewiring our brains, maybe we're looking at this in a different way. Maybe we're saying, well, hang on, actually the experienced users know how to use Google. They are going to be using Google in a different way. They're going to be using more sophisticated search strategies. They're not going to be looking around at things they don't need to look around at so much. They're going to be making 
new types of decisions. They're going to be reasoning about what's the best approach in, in, in finding the information. So obviously they've learned something, so you expect um, a difference in the, the function of their brain when they're carrying out the process. And in fact, those processes I've just mentioned correspond quite nicely to the sorts of activities that you're seeing in the right-hand picture. So yes, Google is rewiring our brain. Anything that we learn rewires our brain. Okay, so you are, we are rewiring your brains. I am rewiring your brains. This conference is rewiring your brains. Having said that, maybe search engines are rewiring our brains in some interesting ways, and I can't resist just telling you about this study by Betsy Sparrow and colleagues that came out since I wrote that review. And her behavioral experimental studies have shown that actually now we are using Google more, we are using search engines more, we're using the internet to find out information. In fact, we are primed more to think about computers when we want to know something. And that means that essentially we are better at knowing where we can find information, in, but we are actually worse at remembering the information. But maybe that's appropriate if that's the world that we are now living in. And I guess this raises this question about the extent to which neuroscience can tell us what we should do. To a large extent, neuroscience can only tell us what we can do. These moral decisions about how we want our brains to change in the future are things that we need to discuss and decide upon for ourselves that everybody needs to discuss. And it's also worth pointing out that some brains are more plastic than others. So if we're going to worry about technology changing people's brains, we probably are better at thinking about these young children. All our brains are plastic, but young children's brains are more plastic than others. And it was true that in the 1990s, research showed that using Facebook, uh, sorry, not using Facebook, using the internet in the 1990s was connected to more social isolation, less optimal psychosocial outcomes. So teenagers who were on the internet more in the 1990s tended to have less friends. And maybe that does support this idea that Facebook is infantilizing us. And it's maybe isolating us. But actually, if you think back to the 1990s, that was a time when Windows was just on the horizon. They were bringing in something called Windows 95. And I remember thinking, well, that will never take off. And I also remember, and I am showing my age, when we had floppy disks that were actually floppy and websites had no pictures. And actually, in that, in that time, if you're a teenager and you were on the internet talking to somebody, you probably were not talking to your friends because most of your friends would not have been on the internet. And now we find recent research is showing that teenagers who use Facebook, use social network sites, are actually better socially connected in the face-to-face -face real world. They tend to stimulate teenagers' social connectedness, not diminish it. However, there is another caveat there, that that's only true if they are using Facebook to support their existing friendships. If they're using it to make new friends, then that's actually associated with um, poor psychosocial outcomes. And that idea of how you use technology, I'm going to come back to again, because that is the basic message. Technology is not really good or bad, it's how you use it. This is another study that's come out since uh, I wrote that review, which I, I have to share with you, because I found this astounding, but understandable in many respects. There are parts of your brain, the size of which are proportional to the number of friends that you have on Facebook. But when you think about it, we know that learning changes the function, the connectivity, and the structure of your brain. So for example, London taxi drivers, the posterior part of their hippocampus, a part of the brain very important for finding your way around London, the more years they've been driving a taxi, the larger their posterior hippocampus. And there are many other studies that show the same thing. So your brain changes shape 
in relation to your learning, when you're learning something. Of course, the interesting question is, since the skull is limited, other parts have to be shrinking. So what part of a taxi driver's brain? Oh, no, okay. And, and these parts of the brain that are increasing in size with your friends on, on Facebook actually are related to social memory. So it makes sense that if you're having to manage and negotiate and remember all these complex relationships amongst your 250 friends, uh, then your social memory is probably improving as a result, and those parts of the brain that code your social memory are probably increasing in their size. I have to say, I've a, I've a very few number of friends on Facebook, so I may not remember your name if you introduce yourself later. Uh. So, is the internet bad for us? Well. If you think about fire, one of the simplest first technologies we ever discovered, it's really good for warmth, and it's really good for toasting muffins. Do you know what a muffin is? <laughs> or is that an English thing? OK, you know what? Put your hand up if you know what a muffin is. It's a very important technical point. Oh, OK, you see? I thought so. OK, I was told I had to use non-sophisticated language and you know, non-specialist language, sorry. Um, the muffin is um, it's a circular piece of bread, and it's very nice when you toast it and you add lots and lots of butter. Very, very, very tasty. So it's good for putting a muffin near the fire and toasting it, but it's bad if you use carelessly. Obviously, you know, you can hurt yourself and hurt others very very much, but you don't see headlines saying panic, fire can hurt you, because we've, we've learned how to use it, we know what the risks are. And it's the same with technology, it's about when you use it, how much you use it, and what you use it for. And in most cases, the hygienic use of technology requires conventional wisdom. In most cases, technology is not a particularly special stimulus. I'll come back to that again in a minute. So when you use technology is important. Technology can disrupt sleep, and that is important not just because sleep gives you rest and makes you feel more wakeful the next day. It's also because memory is consolidated when you are asleep. So if your sleep is disrupted, you're going to remember less about your experiences the day before. And in fact, you can see this very clearly in this wonderful study that was done here, where the activities whilst the person is asleep are actually uh, very, very similar to the types of activities when they were awake. So you're actually recycling your, your experiences and that's laying those memories down so that you can remember them better in the future. And it particularly happens during a part of sleep called slow wave sleep. Unfortunately, small bright screens potentially can disrupt melatonin secretion and melatonin is very important for helping you to go to sleep in a regular way at night. In fact, it's more disruptive than having a television in the corner of the room. And it has been shown in a Belgian study that teenagers who text after lights out are four times more likely to suffer daytime sleepiness. And when I saw that, immediately I knew I had to do something about my children. And so, we, but what do you do? It's very difficult because my children's mobile phone is actually biologically grafted onto them. And if I take it off, they consider that I am violating their human rights. <laughs> so I realize this is not straightforward. So what I do now is I do very discreet nighttime visits to see if I can see any bright lights under the duvet, under the blankets. Because they're not reading, they're texting. Um, and disturbed sleep will help you forget information, unfortunately. Um, it's also about what you use technology for. And this is a study which influences sorry, it demonstrates both the when and the what. This is quite a small sample, so I would like to see more studies like this, but it does illustrate some of the issues. 13 to 14 year olds were allowed to do three things on different days of the week. They were playing computer games, they were watching TV, or they were doing neither, between six and seven o'clock in the evening. Later in that evening, or I think it was actually immediately afterwards, they did a sort of pseudo-homework task where they had to remember some information. Actually, I must say this is a good structured evening in my house if they turn the technology off at seven o'clock. Seems a very reasonable evening for my children. And what they found was, if you look at the top 
graph here, that is the amount of slow wave sleep that they experienced. You can see in the, the white condition, that's doing no technology at all. The black condition is when they're watching television, and it's significantly less slow wave sleep. And the computer games, the lowest amount of slow wave sleep of the lot. The next day, when they were testing them on that information, they found that the condition where there was no technology, they had least memory loss. The condition where they were watching television, they had much more memory loss. And the condition when they were playing computer games gave them the most memory loss of all. So these are important issues that require more research. But clearly, technology, and, and maybe particularly computer games, has the potential to disrupt learning. And it's an issue which needs to be taken up and considered more, I think, by, by everybody. It's also important how much you use it. And we know that exercise can be disrupted if the use is excessive. And unfortunately, we have a small, um, a small amount of the population who really have a problem with using technology. Uh, it varies depending on the methods used to collect the information and, and also the culture, the country. But somewhere between 1.5 and 8.2% of the general population have problematic internet use that is disrupting their life in an unfortunate way that they don't want. They don't really want that to happen. The argument is still ongoing as to whether this is a special psychiatric disorder, internet addiction. Although I do note that in the DSM criteria, there is now an appendix on that. But the interesting question is, what are these people doing who are so addicted to the internet? Well, I'm ashamed to say that if they're adults, they are looking at pornography, or they are pursuing an illicit relationship. However, our children are more moral, perhaps. <laughs> Those who are addicted will be gaming. And this is just one of many, many pieces of, of evidence, as if you needed them. If you're a parent, you don't need to see this evidence, really, to know that video games are extremely engaging. When, and, and some of the scientific evidence shows that when players view images uh, from internet games, there are similar neural activities generated as when addicts of drugs or gambling view images associated with drugs or gambling. And in the bottom right-hand corner, um, sorry, the, the brain image is from that study by Han, but the bottom right-hand corner is a device which I made in our garden shed. Uh, this is my approach. I became quite desperate about this. Um, this is essentially a timer attached to a block of mains sockets so that all the children, well, this is in my teenager's bedroom, all the video games, the television, everything is connected into this block and it's on a timer switch and it cuts out at nine o'clock at night. Uh, I just sort of impart that piece of advice in case you're, <laughs> in case you're also quite, uh, reached that stage of desperateness that I did. Um, so why are they so engaging? Well, games, like many pleasures, stimulate the brain's reward system. And a study was done by Coep who, that showed a very nice image of this. And you can see in the midbrain regions where, where the reward system is that there is a, a great stimulation there in response to this very rapid schedule of rewards that video games provide. Now, actually, that was an early study. Um, and there has been some comment about the methods that were used. But a more recent uh, uh, study by Weinstein has shown the same effect. And in fact, the amount of dopamine release in the reward system is similar to the effects of psychostimulant drugs such as uh, methylphenaldate or Ritalin and some amphetamines. So you might even think about video games as a type of environmental Ritalin. And that may explain why, if you do apply mental health criteria, and that's very debatable whether you should. Um, you know, you do end up with this significant proportion of teenagers, mostly boys, I have to say, who are particularly uh, addicted to their games. So are games a special stimulus? Well, I would argue that they are. I, I believe that one of the reasons why games are so engaging is not just the rapid schedule of rewards, but because the rewards are uncertain. You don't know whether you're going to get an outcome or not. And this um, effect of, of reward uncertainty and why it stimulates this additional dopamine in the reward system was illustrated by, this, uh, by a very nice study by Fiorillo who was measuring the dopamine in the midbrain regions of a monkey looking at visual patterns. And in the 
the, the top blue lines show you that the, the, the stimulus goes on, the pattern goes on, and then it goes off. And then sometimes a reward arrives, a little drop of honey at the end. And the green line, the top green line, shows you what happens when the monkey sees uh, a pattern that it knows with a probability of one, 100% certainty, is going to result in a reward. As soon as it sees the pattern, it gets a spike of dopamine, but then there is no uh, further response. Even when the reward arrives, there is no dopamine response because it was so predictable it was going to happen. So this reward response is very much influenced by expectations. The bottom line shows you what happens when it sees a pattern that has never been associated with reward. So there's no spike of dopamine when it sees the pattern, but when the reward arrives, oh, wasn't expecting that, I do want that, thank you very much, spike of dopamine. The interesting thing is what happens when it sees a pattern that in the past, half the time has been associated with reward, half the time has not. Then it gets a spike as if it's going to get a reward, and the dopamine ramps up until the outcome is known. And that means that over time, there is more dopamine produced in the midbrain for uncertain rewards than either wholly predictable rewards or wholly unexpected rewards. And this dopamine signal is very important because actually it is proportional to how much you want something quite often. So it's a, it's a very visceral type of motivation. It, 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 it's there when well, and they've measured all these things in scanners, goodness knows how, but sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of those things where you see it, and I want it now, that's the type of uh, motivation response that dopamine is associated with in that region. Now, I've put a fish there to remind me to say to you that this mechanism is very, very old. And in fact, in evolutionary terms, it was present in the earliest fishes 400 million years ago. So what we're looking at here is, an, is a behavioral bias in the way we respond to something which has a very, very old ancient history to it. I'll come back to that in a minute. But an important point to, uh, that I want to make here is that this is not just about engagement and I want. This is also about learning. This emotional response of that, you know, of that visceral emotional response also predicts how much you are going to remember something. Okay, it predicts declarative memory formation. Actually, the number of gold stars that you give out in a class do not predict whether the child is going to remember that experience. There's always been a very problematic relationship between the rewards offered and memory formation. However, there is a much more linear relationship, a more predictable relationship between the way your brain responds to reward and whether you remember uh, something. So along the bottom of the axis there, is the memory that's been achieved, and at the top axis is the amount of activity in a region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is a very important part of your reward system. Okay, I, I have to say, though, we still don't know, well, we're not completely sure, we still are researching the mechanisms involved with that. So why dopamine enhances memory formation is a subject of nascent research at the moment. But it does help explain why video games are very good teachers. Now, I know they don't always teach the things we want them to teach, but it has been noticed that they improve visual motor performance. In other words, the speed with which you can respond to a visual stimulus. They improve your ability to switch your visual attention. They improve your ability to suppress visual distraction. They improve your ability to infer an action's probable outcome, and they can even improve your contrast sensitivity, which is one of the primary factors that limit your sight. So in fact, vid action video games are, are being used now in interventions to improve uh, damaged sight. And it's not a self-selection effect. There's a whole, um, there are many different sort of streams of, of evidence that are converging on this idea that video games can teach. For example, you can take non-game players and after 10 hours see some of these effects. And also you can see longitudinal changes in the habits of uh, game players and how those are related to these skills. And we also see transfer to professional, some, some few professional uh, activities. So for example, laparoscopic surgeons are better at laparoscopic surgery if they play action Wii games on the Wii. Yeah? And the Israeli Defense Force insist that their pilots play action video games because it 
improves their performance in, in the sky. Unfortunately, they do sometimes teach things we don't want them to. And they teach effective response as well. And there is converging data that violent video games teach aggressive response. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, we cannot say that that means that you can blame a video game when somebody goes out and commits a violent act. All we can say is that when you give people hypothetical scenarios about how they would behave, their tendencies in those hypothetical scenarios are more aggressive when they've been playing action video games. That's the type of research that, that this is based on. There are correlational studies that show violent video game players have more aggressive tendencies. There are experimental studies where you take non-gamers, get them to play violent video games, their aggression increases. Longitudinal studies that show the aggression varies with game habits. But of course, this has to be hypothetical aggression because it's not ethical to carry out studies involving real violence and aggression. But most convincing for me is a neurophysiological study that shows the electrical activity uh, as measured by EEG is actually diminished when you're watching a video of real violence if you have recently been playing a violent video game. And similarly, on the positive side, there is the same streams of evidence showing that pro-social games, where you are given rewards for making friends and for helping people, um, actually teach empathy. So and again, again, that reinforces this idea that video games can teach um, effective response. Well, if you're interested in, that, uh, in those ideas, you want to know more about it, um, you can download the study in English for free, which is on the website, which I'll give you again at the end. Um, or there is also a Spanish, uh, in, in Spanish uh, book, which is actually a better version of the report because it talks about what you might want to do about it in your home as well. So I wrote this with my wife, having done the review of the research, to discuss, well, how could you actually cope with this in the family? It's got all the research in there as well. Um, and it's, it's available at cost price, which is $7, um, on a website called Lulu, which I'll give, you the web, I'll give you the website at the end. So, in most cases, uh, there's no special influence of technology, but video game might be a special one. Exceptional levels of engagement, exceptional enhancement of learning processes, or as, as one scientist has put it, the potential to take the brakes off adult plasticity. It has real potential. Same brain processes involved in the hazard and the potential benefit if we start using these video games in education. But do children behave the same way when you use this principle of uncertain reward in the classroom? So I'm moving on now to the educational applications that we've been looking at. So the first thing we did was a bridging study. We said, OK, if instead of points, we offer uncertain points, uncertain reward to children, Will they prefer that? Will we see this same bias towards uncertain reward in children as you saw in the monkey? So, so what we did, we asked them to choose their maths question from Mr. Certain, who would give them a point if they got the question correct, or Mr. Uncertain, who would, if you got the question correct, would toss a coin and either you get two points for heads or no points for tails. And what we saw was that as the, pro as the session progressed, so more and more, the children were choosing their questions from Mr. Uncertain. It was a, an effect that we saw for boys and girls, but it was stronger in the boys. But what we're doing here is quite subversive, because in my background in education, I also spent time as a school inspector. Hang on a minute. Oh, that's better. <laughs> In my time as a school inspector, I was always telling schools, because the government had, had told me, that reward consistency underpins motivation. You always have to be consistent. If a child knows the right answer, they should have a reward. So what we're saying now is that actually, no, reward uncertainty can be more motivating. So let's see what happens when we put this into a classroom and we listen to how the children are talking. So we made up this very nasty game called Wipeout, and in this game, the children were rolling a dice. They were working in pairs, in teams of pairs, to beat the computer. They were up against the computer. And they would roll the dice, 
and they could win the points on the dice if they answered the multiple choice question correctly. And then they could roll again if they wanted to. If they answered it incorrectly, they would get feedback on their question, what the correct answer was, and they knew they had to pay attention because the question would come around again. And also, it would have to, they'd have to pass it back to the computer as well. It would be the computer's turn next. The really nasty thing about this was that you didn't want to keep answering questions and throwing the dice because if you threw a one, you'd have all your points taken away for that turn. And if you threw a double one, you'd have all your points taken away for the entire game. So that meant that children would be accumulating points, partly as a result of their learning, and then 15 or 20 minutes into the game, they'd all be taken away on the throw of a dice. And we expected anarchy, we expected complaints about fairness, um, but we had none of that. We had pure joy, excitement, the room turned into an amusement arcade, we had good learning games, and the only issue of fairness was that the children felt that the computer knew what the answers were more than they did, and they felt that was unfair. So the next version has to be a, a slightly less intelligent computer, maybe. But the interesting thing was, the other interesting thing was that when they failed, they would say, you know, when they lost the game, they would say, oh, we just had really bad luck, you know. And when they succeeded, it was because they were absolutely brilliant. And, and these two here actually did a, a victory dance and a song when they, when they, it was all about, we are the greatest, we are the greatest. So we see this emergence of sport talk, like fans coming out of a football match. If they've lost, it's because they were robbed, but if, you know, and, and they just are really unlucky, not their fault. And if they win, it's because uh, they are the, the best in the world. And it's a very motivational type of discourse. But is it just a sugar coating on the bitter pill of learning? Well, to find out the answer to that, we connected up adults to a polygraph and measured their skin conductivity when they were playing two types of this game, two versions of the game. One where the dice were stuck, so this was the no game condition, and you can see that there's no emotional response here, the beginning for the no game condition when the dice are rolled, because they know they're gonna get a double three. And when they answer the question, there is some emotional response. But in the gaming condition, not only do they have an emotional response when they roll the dice, but the emotional response when they're answering the question is also greater. So the gaming context is actually making the whole experience of learning more emotional. And that's important because we know that emotion can support the learning process. How strong is the theory? Well, we built a neurocomputational model to estimate the brain's reward response. And we found in this game here, I won't go into the details of the game, but it was a game for which we were able to build a neurocomputational model. That's why we developed it. What we found uh, with adults is that we could actually predict when they were going to get the answer correct based on their estimated brain response. And I'm also pleased to say, relieved, I think, to say as well, that the study has been replicated recently uh, by a Turkish group of scientists who say the experimental results of this study reveal that uncertainty enhances learning. Uncertainty is found to be positively associated with motivation. And as the motivation increases, participants tend to spend more time on answering the questions. They tend to have a higher accuracy in these questions. And another important thing about the, uh, this study is that these researchers actually used a different type of learning. It was not just facts. It required a deeper understanding. So this effect of reward uncertainty is therefore deep learning as well. However, we were not yet at a stage where we could really develop something to use in the classroom. There were some things that the neuroscience was not telling us as it presently existed. And one of those was the way in which you respond to your competitor's reward, because these are going to be competitive games if you're looking at your neighbour. Now, you might think that it's obvious that your opponent's loss is going to stimulate your reward system. But actually, what we know about reinforcement learning theory, which is the, the type of learning theory uh, which has been most studied using neuroimaging, is that reward tends to reinforce action. Okay, reward reinforces action. And the problem is that if you 
are only getting a reward response when your competitor makes a mistake, then it is their failures that are being reinforced in your mind. And that doesn't really seem to make sense because you want to learn about the way to win the game, not the way to lose it. So we had to run another study, uh, this time using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to look at what happens when you are playing a competitor. And what we found was quite interesting. Firstly, you mirror, you mirror your opponent's actions as if they are yours. So we, we saw mirror neuron activity, motor cortex activity, when the opponent made a move as if the player themselves was making that move. And then, yes, we saw reward response in relation to the opponent's unexpected failure. And all the regions in the bottom of this slide are related to inhibition of movement. So what you're learning to do is you're learning to stop imitating your participant when they make an unexpected error. But the important thing for the game is that it's your opponent's failures that stimulate your, your dopamine. So that has obviously implications in the classroom. How you actually teach using these sorts of ideas depends on, um, depends on many other things other than the neuroscience. It depends on the expertise of the teacher. It depends on all the other standard and not so standard insights that teachers have. And we knew that, and we knew we had to work with teachers to develop a teaching approach based on it. And so we developed prototype software, working with teachers, working with children. And in fact, this is one of our first experiments using a, a wheel of fortune. And we had fantastic engagement, and the children learnt absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> and that is why you cannot take a brain scan and turn it straight into a lesson plan. There has to be this communication. So eventually we did understand many things. One of them is to be aware of when the dopamine is ramping up and to use that as a teachable moment. That's the time to say, right, okay children, or students, actually we use this for postgraduate neuroscientists as well, these are the things you should remember, okay, and use that as a scaffolding opportunity to scaffold their learning. We also had to work with developers very closely to develop an application that could be used. And if you have a computer in the classroom and you have a way of displaying the computer screen on the wall or on a screen, then you're able to use this free app, or you have to be connected to the internet as well. But if you've got all those three things, then you can download this. Um, it's absolutely free. We've already got a lot of teachers using it. Um, there are 12,000 12, topics that have been created by other teachers, so you may not even have to create your own questions. And it's also possible for, teach, for their students to respond using mobile phones, or they can just put their hand up, or they can use a laptop or an iPad or anything, really. And it's been completely translated into Spanish as well. So if you go to the website, www.zondel.com, here, that's the one. Um, down in the bottom right-hand corner, you can choose the language, and it's 100% translated into Spanish already. It's being used by, 20, by teachers in 20 different countries, 2,000 times a month. That's about 8,000 teams. And we're getting very positive feedback from it. But I have to say, our classroom evaluation has been about looking at whether the learning games, the learning gains, sorry, the improvements in learning are reasonable as you, you know, are good in terms of our expectations and in terms of the teacher expectations. I think this is a, something which is very good as a research topic for teachers to go and try this and actually compare it with what they're doing already and, and report on that. I think it would make a, a wonderful research project. Um, it's wonderful to have testaments uh, like this from Mrs. Herbert, and we've got lots of them, but there's, nothing, there's no real substitute for real trials, and that's the next thing that we have to look at. But the principles, we have been trying to research. But, but even the principles, I'd say we probably only know 10% of what we would like to know about the connection between reward, learning, and games. And it's been a long process. Um, you know, and Mark was talking about what we need to build these bridges and the sorts of paths that we should be taking. And 
you know, we started with some neuroscience research, but also some psychological research as well. We did a lot of bridging studies, had to develop practice with teachers, developing resources with technologists. We're finding ways of disseminating it amongst teachers, getting it into government policy. It's been a very long road, probably about seven years to educational impact. And uh, if I've just got one minute, have I got? Oh, am I good? Okay. I can't resist um, making this brief evolutionary note because uh, I've got a little time at the moment for me to look at evolution, and I'm, it's what I'm studying at the moment. And I'm very excited that I'm going to the Galapagos Islands um, on Sunday to deliver a paper looking at the connections and the paper. I'm excited about the paper, <laughs> but I'm also excited about the Galapagos Islands, I've got to admit. Um, but I'm very excited because I think that... Um, evolution is relevant to mind, brain and education because ideas about evolution have influenced educational thinking since Darwin who himself wrote to the edu American Educational Association suggesting that they were relevant as to how we uh, would, should teach children. But neuroscience is helping prompt a new thinking in evolution which is less species centric. It's not all about, you know, we no longer think of humans as, as being at the top of some tree of progression. We no longer think of evolution as being even directional. It's about adapting to the environment. And it's also about considering evolution across deep time, not just the Stone Age. And when you start looking at evolution in that way, it emphasizes the importance of some of these very old brain systems that have been present, as I say, in early fishes since the 400 million years ago. Because the cortex is very plastic, but some of these more subcortical systems uh, we do have to work with, and it's good that we've got them because they support a lot of our very important learning processes, but they also bias them. And that's why it's important to understand them. They don't always do what we expect them to do. So I suppose my, my political point is that these emotional, motivational systems, they still support and bias our learning today, and we do need to take more notice of them. It's not all about our wrinkly cortex. So if you'd like to know more, um, Tracy mentioned the book Introducing Neuroeducational Research. That is also available in Spanish from the publishers La Murala. Um, Digital Technology in the Brain has also been translated, and that's available on Lulu, and that website is www.lulu.com. Um, and I don't know, okay, I've got to, I'm gonna have to shift this up because I need to show the website it's not the a bottom. Mac user. So is it possible? I don't know if, if that would actually, does that do the job? Can you see that? You can see that, I can, can see that, Tracy, fantastic. Okay, so we've got Adriana's contact email because we really do want to talk to teachers, so please do use that email. Um, but www.neuroeducational.net is where we have a lot of free resources as well. It can also direct you to those books if you have managed to take down those details. Um, thank you very much, I think we've got some time for questions. Fantastic. Okay. You can you can ask these questions in Spanish because I've got some magic headphones. I hope I've got some magic headphones. Hi. Thank you very much. I was uh, struck by the finding about dopamine um, and the amount of uh, dopamine in an uncertain award, reward condition can, compared to a more certain reward. And it got me thinking about the amount of time that a person is, spent, is spending doing uncertain rewards and having all of that dopamine and whether there's, um, in your experience, any papers or if you have an instinct about what the cutoff point might be, right? If I spend an hour a day, two hours a day with uncertain reward, is that going to shift my ability to enjoy things mm. that don't have that same level? Do you, I mean, this is one of the questions I would love. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah. So I, this is one of the questions I would love to know the answer to. So we have taught whole science topics, like about five or six lessons, using this technique, using the prototype software. And the children at the end of it said they would prefer to be taught this way all the time. But we don't know what would happen if they were taught that way all the time. I don't know what the knock-on effects would be to other lessons, for example, when they go to a lesson that is not 
all about gaming. Um, I do think it's unlikely that there is going to be any uh, tendency towards becoming a pathological gambler because uh, it's worth mentioning that because I do get asked that sometimes. The problem about pathological gambling occurs when people in their, in their childhood are, are involved in activities to do with money. Um, it's not playing games like Monopoly or Snakes and Ladders or card games. If, if, if there's no money involved, it, there's no evidence that it leads to, to gambling. But in terms of, uh, in terms of how, how much of a curriculum could be delivered entirely through a gaming context, I would love to know the answer to that. I suppose I could be facetious and say, I guess the answer is how long can a child stay on a computer game? <laughs> In which case, there is no limit at all. <laughs> but we don't really know. A wonderful opportunity for some research, I think. Um, I'm curious too, have you done any research on other neurotransmitters and hormones that might be released in this kind of activity like norepinephrine and cortisol? And now we know that cortisol both enhances, facilitates, and hinders learning. No, we haven't. Um, so the, the, the question is whether we've looked at any other, in a way, you're asking have we looked at any other explanations or mechanisms that might be involved. And you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some really important ones that we haven't got a clue about. And I know that Daphne Bavelier, for example, who I quoted before, she also has suggested the dopamine explanation. And we've had some success in pursuing that. But she's also mentioned an alternative explanation involving some of the neurotransmitters that you mentioned. Um, so I think... One, I mean, her, her theory, one, one of her theories is that it may involve something to do with movement. So because the children are, are moving on computer games, uh, that, that, may, that may be something to do with it as well. Uh, so I think that that's another area which, if I had time, I would love to, to research, because I think that's, that's quite possible. Um, since you're doing research of, on this, I wonder if you have uh, encountered any instances of uh, people that has been using something like this kind of more naturally in the past, or teachers that told you, yeah, I tried that before and it really helps my class, or did anybody approach you? And I, when, we, when we first hit upon this idea and wanted to test it, we were scouring for technology that would allow us to just test the principle, commercially available technology. And for example, audience response systems like Quizdom that allow you to collect responses and then display them on the board, none of them allow you to disrupt that relationship between the response and the outcome. None of them allow you to disrupt it with an element of chance. So, the simple answer is no. I, I didn't come across, uh, apart from video games, where the jury is out as to whether this explains it or not, but I think it seems quite likely. But apart, apart from video, no, there was, there was nothing that I could find that was already available. And I should say that what we've done, although I'm very proud of it, I think in 10 years' time, people will look back on it and laugh at it because it's so primitive. We are right at the beginning of an adventure here where probably in the classroom, children will uh, be responding not just by choosing the answers to questions, but you know, moving things across the screen, um, you know, networking, communicating with each other, just as they do in, in commercial games. Do you have time for one more? You're good? Okay. Did you want to ask a question? Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for your um, fascinating talk. I just um, wondered if you could exp uh, explain a little more. You mentioned bridging studies. And I wonder if you could clarify a little bit about what they were. I could see photographs um, where of kids in school uniform. It looks like you were in the classroom. Um, were they? Were you testing the same questions that you'd used in the lab um, in the classroom, or were you um, in, in, in a replication or something else? 
Yes, the word bridging study is very open to interpretation. Uh, my personal interpretation of it is a way of testing the salience and value of a scientific concept. So we would do, we would do experiments in the laboratory, which I would describe as scientific studies, because the material might not be school curriculum material. It might not be involving the types of students that you wanted to reach. And it might be involving an environment that you couldn't possibly reconstruct in a classroom. So the next stage, to my mind, is to do quasi-experimental studies using school curriculum knowledge that they're learning. So they're actually doing something valuable with real children, if you like, um, in a classroom environment. Um, and making sure that the effects that you're seeing in that environment, even though it's still quite controlled, but it's not entirely controlled, um, is, is worthwhile. And of course, those sorts of studies are sometimes difficult to publish as scientific studies, but they're really, really important. Can you take one more? Is that OK? Sure, yeah. In, in your presentation, you talk about the, some benefits of video games. Uh, is it applied to any kind of video games, as narrative games, transmedia games, or just action games? It just seems to be action video games. Strategy games don't seem to have the same effect. So that sort of, you know, perhaps suggests that the action and movement probably is part of what's going on. But on the other hand, I also think that action video games provide a much faster schedule, uh, the much fuller, more rapid schedule of rewards. So I think that the, the dopamine explanation could still explain that as well. But it does seem to be restricted to action video games. Okay, I'm afraid we have to, we're going to wrap up right now. However, if you would like to come up to the front and talk to Howard for a few more minutes, just a few announcements. Um, first, Please, a wonderful applause for something very provocative, a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.